Uh, all right, uh, let's go into our last segment here on a Monday, you know, light news day and a very busy anticipated news week. But uh, yeah, light news today, but big, big week, though. Not, not going to be a light big, week. big week. Marky, the commodity corner. This is a new segment uh, that we're going to be working on Mondays, you know, kind of rotating things in and, uh, you know, having different ways to, to break things down, analyze them, have some fun. And you're the commodity guy at Tackle Trading. You've done the commodity report now for what, uh, two, two and a half, three years? I mean, I don't wow. know exactly when. And, and even started. before that, like, even before I came to Tackle Trading, about the only thing I was ever interested in was oil and natural gas and, mm -hmm. you know, the precious metals. I, I've always been fascinated by commodities. Um, one, because they're amazing cash flow, uh, the ability to cash flow on commodities. Two, I like just the general macro nature uh, where, you know, you, you got these big themes that develop and those big themes can play out over time. And, and when trends get going, they can be very powerful in commodities and support and resist. There's, I just love commodities. I think, I think it, it is an amazing, and it's been a good year, right? It's been a good year in stocks. It's been a good year in commodities over the last 12 months as well uh, off those COVID lows. I mean, the percentage gains in silver off the, the March lows, the percentage gains in, 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 in oil off those March lows. I mean, these are amazing gains. Um, and I think there's still room to run. But, but what we're going to highlight, and so we're going to, every week we're going to highlight a trade or a big theme or something, you know, and, and we talk about commodities all the time at Tackle Trading. Like, it, it is just one of those core things. I mean, Matt's been great on gold, made me money on gold in his analysis over the last couple of weeks. And uh, just love the world of commodities, and there's lots of opportunities. But today we're going to talk about oil. And if you'll pull up the crude oil chart, because whenever I – and we're going to specifically talk about energy stocks – now, when I analyze commodities, and I don't care if it is a gold mining company, I don't care if it's FCX, the copper mining that does a little bit of gold money, I don't care if it's a silver mining company, I don't care what the company is, I always start my analysis from a top-down perspective on oil itself. And oftentimes, when I, when I trade short-term, it's always based on technicals. Um, I'll look at support i'll look at resistance i'll look at trend i mean it's just like if i have a short-term trade it's going to be a hundred percent technical analysis a hundred percent of the time because it should be right like if you're going to be in a trade for a week or two weeks or even a month or if you're somewhere in the swing trading range uh, i'm going to base it on technicals a hundred percent a hundred percent of the time but every once in a while as i'm analyzing the market i'll develop a theme I'll develop like a thesis, if you will, on an underlying commodity or an underlying stock. Uh, a great example of this, and it wasn't, I wasn't the only one, is the reopening plays like last year. Uh, I mean, how many times did you hear me say Cinemark, Cinemark, Cinemark when it was getting killed? It's because I had a thesis on the cruise ships and movie theaters. I had this thesis and I was like, I'm betting on vaccine development. I'm betting on a return to normalcy. And so I'll develop this overarching thesis on a subject. And, you know, sometimes I'm right, sometimes I'm wrong. But those thesis bets, those, and that's where I'll oftentimes go to my long-term position trading. I'll go to my long-term investing. If I believe in a company or I believe in uh, a story, a thesis, if you will, however you want to phrase that then I can be very, very stubborn um, as long as nothing alters the thesis, right? Like in the reopening play, had you had like a COVID variant that was killing one out of three people, right? Or if the vaccines were duds. I mean, things can change and you can't be so stubborn you don't change. All right. So with crude oil, uh, I have been very bullish on oil, uh, as a general rule, always from a cash flow perspective, because one of my theses, one of my overarching themes behind oil uh, has been that the Saudi Arabia, after the disaster, and if you pull up a multi-year chart, Matt, after the disaster of them trying to fight the frackers, and Matt, can you give a little insight on the, the, them fighting the frackers? And Matt might have stepped away there for a second, but... Are you talking about Saudi Arabia fighting the Yeah, frackers? I mean, back in 2015, 2016. Sure, they went to war with them pretty much. They I mean, went to war. Like, and war, and yeah. if you pull up like a multi-year chart, 
So what Saudi Arabia did, and and it's important to understand this backstory because it gives you bullish context to one of the most important things in oil. They tried to, as fracking became more and more popular, Saudi Arabia is like, we're going to put these people out of business. And they started a price war. Well, it failed. Oil plummeted. And they changed their tune after that. And you'll hear me joke when I'm talking commodities, the Saudi princes have your back. Because they philosophically made a change in their meetings, in their dialogue. I, re- I mean, I read so much material during this time period. And they shifted. They're like, okay, we're not going to do that ever again. Well, They're not going to do can that. I, can I speak to that very quickly? Uh, I, I, yeah, I would add that, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, this is when they started it. And I'm not going to give all the context of what happened during the, 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 the great oil war of 2014 through 2016. But it was fascinating to see the Saudi response as oil was down here. Mm-hmm. And, and throughout this entire rundown, the level of confidence Saudi Arabia had was, was quite amazing to, to witness. The amount of confidence they had here was well deserved since they had zero. See what they felt, what they thought they were going to do in here is bankrupt the American fracking companies. What they don't realize is we'll send those roughnecks home, but we're not going to shut down the pipelines. And so we, as we sent everybody home, and we did, we lost three hundred thousand jobs in this year. In this year, but you know what? Also, Saudi Arabia did went into a hundred billion dollars in debt sparked an economic situation for their country to where they would they had to borrow from their pensions which they'd never done when you take money away from the saudi princess mark they're they're not very happy nope. they shifted their tune right here because they felt they were going to be in a much better position as the american and the russian fracking companies were struggling that they were going to be in a much better position the entire assessment was that fifty dollars per share on oil that these American fracking companies could not be profitable. Well, what Saudi Arabia didn't realize is that America, Russia, and a lot of other countries could still be profitable at about $40, $42 a share. And even when it went down to $30, Saudi Arabia didn't have the edge that they thought they had when they started their stupidity of a war uh, against the American frackers in 14. And it did shift them, and it did scare them, and they do it not philosophically want to see, they do them. not want to see that again. Yeah, no, and and so like, and this is one of the things like on like when you're developing theses in a market, the understanding it's it's like if you were to dive into an individual company, and and know all you want to know all the details. If you're going to long term invest, you don't want to know the details. You you want to know, uh, you know, if the CEOs only shares or if they're selling shares. Their, their growth numbers, their, their products, you know, all kinds of things. But that backstory on Saudi Arabia is really important as a bull to give me confidence in holding oil positions, that philosophical change. And they have reiterated that time and time again. Now, there was a six-week spat with Russia at the height of COVID last year where the Saudi princes got a little, where Saudi Arabia got a little uppity, uh, and they quickly turned their name. They're like, all right. So there's a philosophical commitment to keep that supply at a moderate level. Now, one thing you know about oil is if the oil gets into the high 70s and the 80s, Russia will open up the pipelines. But we're not there yet. We're not there yet. Now, so that's one of the underarching thesis of why I still believe in cash flow from a bullish perspective oil. But more specifically, uh, tying into that reopening, Tying into that reopening, everybody expects that the U.S. economy is going to be very, very robust. I mean, some of the figures that are showing about GDP growth this year, because you have there's two two sides to the oil equation. There's the supply side. Well, you've had a lot of wells shut down in the U.S. The Saudi princes have your back. There's moderation on the supply side, but now it's over to the demand side, and. We still haven't even come close to experiencing a full economic reopening. In fact, over the last five, six weeks, which has weighed on the price of oil, you have had a ton of negative COVID headlines, not necessarily here in the United States, but around the world. 
you had five, six weeks ago, Europe locking down again, Great Britain locking down again, uh, you know, worries about, you know, vaccine distribution. You've had headlines from around different emerging markets and even developed markets, Japan, India, uh, Brazil. You've had a ton, just a metric ton of negative COVID data uh, from news headlines, and, and, you know, from different parts of the world. And got to understand that oil is a global uh, globally based uh, thing. It's not, you know, the U.S. It's not just the U.S. It's, it's the world. Is what is the demand around the world? And in the face of tremendous negative headlines on COVID, oil stuck a support level for three weeks. It stuck a support level for three weeks. And whenever you've had a really strong move, and, and the move from the election up to the start of March, that was a massive move, like percentage-wise in oil. You really didn't have that big a sell-off. You did not have that big a sell-off, and you developed a nice little support level in the face of extremely negative COVID demand headlines from around the world. So in the face of a lot of negativity on the demand side, you stuck a support level. Now, you st and I still, and once again, I have been betting for a year placing trades, if you will, investing, position trading on reopening themes, reopening plays. One of the reasons I still believe, particularly from a cash flow perspective, oil and oil energy companies, and we'll get into oil energy companies here in a second, is that I still think you got juice uh, on the reopening. When things, when those COVID headlines turn and Japan and India and different areas of the world, when those headlines reverse and they become positive headlines, well, you take this sentiment weight off of oil. You take this negativity surrounding the demand side away from oil. And as long as Saudi princes and US production, which we have to remember during the last year, a metric ton of wells got shut down. Uh, in fact, I mean, we, we during the height of COVID in March and April and May, every week that rig count that you saw dramatically declined. I mean, there were weeks that were just shutting them down massively. Well, you can't just flip a rig overnight. We are still nowhere near the production numbers in the United States on oil today that we were a year, a year ago, we, I mean, and especially 14 months ago. And so the supply side equation is really, really juicy right now. All you need is that demand kicker right now for upward movement. movement. Now, even without the, the kicker, the catalyst, even without the catalyst, uh, you should see stability because you have in the face of negativity without that catalyst, you have saw stability. You have a nice consolidation pattern formed on oil. And so now let's get to energy companies itself. So that's part of my thesis. Demand reopening still got legs to go, held up well in the face of those negative headlines. And we're going to start seeing it this week and next week and the week after as oil company after oil company after oil company starts reporting the results. Now, this will be the first quarter in which they're reporting results with oil at elevated prices over the last year. So they've reported in recent, the Exxons, the Apaches, the Oxys, all of your different oil companies have had reports, but that's what, when oil has, was depressed in prices. This is gonna be the first quarter of earnings reports in which you get reports where oil for the first quarter was you know, high 50s, 60s for most of the quarter. And so you're gonna get the first quarter of results with oil at elevated price levels. Now, one of the thesis, and, and I don't even know if this is a thesis, I think this is just kind of a fact, is that during the last year, when oil was getting obliterated near the bottom, when oil was at these ridiculously depressed prices, in order to survive, companies had to do massive, massive cost cuts. They had to, out of necessity, they had to because if they did, 
<laughs> there were, I mean, you, you saw some of the silliness of, can Exxon Mobil go bankrupt? Not some low level producer. Can Exxon Mobil go bankrupt? I mean, that was the type of fear that was out. Well, there. And, and, and Mark, quite frankly, it was deserved. Mm-hmm. It, it, it was the things we were seeing from a fundamental perspective destroys companies, literally destroys companies. They cease to exist. Now with Exxon, did we ever get to that? No, we didn't, but we certainly got into the, how is Exxon not going to cut their dividend mode? Oh, absolutely. That right. Was- I, I mean, we certainly were all over that and we were wrong. Exxon not only sur- survived as expected, but they they maintained dividend, which I think was kind of unexpected, mm-hmm. given given the the gravity of the situation that we all were faced with last year, not knowing the uh, the depths of the problem and not even knowing how not even knowing how how far reaching this problem was truly going to be around the globe and how that would impact a global company that does business in the commodity market like ExxonMobil. It, it, it was just a very, very nerve wracking situation. So even though, you know, I, I, I and, and Tackle never really got into the, oh my goodness, the dire mode of Exxon dying, like all of us in both public and private conversations were extremely concerned about about Exxon's ability to maintain their dividend. And, and that dividend is critical because when you cash flow energy stocks, the dividend plays a huge, massive role in that cash flow strategy because it's often quite juicy. And so, I mean, if whether they could maintain their dividend, whether it was Exxon or any, that's that was a massive storyline in the energy space. Mm-hmm. Okay. So you have companies that have had to cut their costs. You've got elevated oil prices. Now, you, do you get a jump up? Economy reopens. Uh, oil goes to 70, goes to 75. You know, we'll see that on the techno. You know, momentum's a funny thing, right? When it gets going, it get, can, can get going. But even without that, that's a bonus to me as a cash flow trader, as someone who sells calls on companies I own, who sells naked puts at lower prices if I don't own that company energy companies with dividend, I see a totally stabilized market with a potential upside kicker to it if that reflation trade gets going. And I see energy companies that have a profitability structural because of everything that's happened in the last year that they're not going to have that dividend, oh my goodness, do I have to cut? I think you could start seeing dividend hikes. And so from a value perspective, and a true value, both, you know, energy is always the value in the value space, but, you know, just genuine value, a uh, cash flow perspective. Um, I see opportunity in energy stocks. Now, if you want to wait and I'll let you guys go for specific technicals, right? But that's why I still believe, you know, that totality of everything is why I have not trimmed my energy positions in the last month. Uh, having, you know, you, no one loves downward price action, but I'm stubborn when I have a thesis. And I think the thesis is solid from a cash flow perspective. What do you guys think? Well, I mean, uh, let's talk about the two, two big ones here this week uh, that come out and report earnings, ExxonMobil, Chevron. I mean, I don't think that's going to impact uh, your analysis here, Mark, uh, but it's something I know that for me personally, I am eagerly anticipating wanting to see what these guys do post because a lot of the thesis will, will learn how much profitability they did have in Q1 if they had it uh, by this week, you know, when these two companies do post up numbers. So that's one thing I'm, I'm anticipating myself. I'm an investor in, in Exxon. I own it. Uh, I've not gotten rid of it. I'm not going to get rid of it. I'm a believer of what uh, you know they can do over the next year or two as they've uh, come off these you know really really depressed prices at the low points and they did reaffirm those dividends. I want to know about the profitability. Did they did they turn a profit this quarter? What do, what are we looking at from that perspective? Uh, Short term charts obviously have not they've got some things to work through and they've got uh, a lot left to be desired in that regard. They've been stuck in the mud here for about five weeks. 
Uh, long term, though, that's a level that they're fighting for support on. So I'm 100% a believer in, uh, you know, the, the idea behind this. There's still some unanswered questions that we'll learn from these earnings reports, which I'm looking forward to. Uh, Matt, what about you? Um, I think they're in an environment where I think that I think people, investors and traders should be a little excited if, if certain things play out. This is a space where when you're looking at crude, you're seeing crude catch up all the way to pre-pandemic levels, right? Mm -hmm. And and that's a lot of my stabilization argument is, is crude will stabilize to pre-pandemic levels. Now, whether or not we catch price appreciation, breakouts, to me, that's a secondary factor, right? Because I'm not talking specifically about crude trading and breaking out of $64, for example. But when you're looking at crude, again, pre-pandemic, post-pandemic, price has recovered. When you look at the energy space itself, price has yet to recover. It's one of the few spaces in the market that has not recovered pre-pandemic. Now, even before the pandemic, if I go back in time, you see an environment that hasn't exactly been robust and hasn't exactly been great. And so the stabilization argument for crude oil in general is simply energy prices catching up faster because crude achieved that stabilization and crude, crude achieved that pre-pandemic at a faster pace than, say, the energy components did. So I, I do think the entire argument that Mark's making here is predicated on the fact that energy will catch up as crude oil has stabilized. Is that is that correct? Oh, yeah, I mean, that definitely plays in. I mean, I, okay. listen, I still like I like I always will like a chart that has room to run. Right. Yeah. But, but in general, this is what we're talking about. Yes. Right. And you're discussing the reasons why you still like this. Correct. Because it has shown a little bit of weakness, a uh, little bit of uh, chinks in the armor to a certain extent over the course of the last couple of weeks. It's been a little bit of a, uh, well, obviously fallen out of favor, but technically challenging environment for, for energy in general. Mm -hmm. But I take a look at, say, ExxonMobil here, Tim, the, the biggest component of the space, one of the major players in the marketplace. You're at a price threshold right now where I, I do think you're excited. I do think you're excited. You're excited for a couple reasons. Number one, you got a double bottom right here in that 55 range. Technically, that's that's pretty solid foundation. That's also occurring at the previous resistance over here of 55. I like that. Obviously, we got a catalyst coming out this week that can spark some momentum one way or the other. And and ExxonMobil is not one of those stocks that's going to fly on earnings typically. Mm -hmm. Right. It's a it's just not a company that's going to go up 10 percent on earnings. But you could see a, a scenario now, obviously, if the if the movement's down, I mean, that that scenario, we're not looking to short. Right. That's that's more of a how do you protect your investment, Tim, mm -hmm. scenario, you know, right covered calls or whatever the case might be, uh, how how aggressive versus conservative you want to be in in trade management there. But what I'm talking about is this right shoulder here, uh, right north of 57 and a half. If you get that positive catalyst coming on this weekly chart, you're in an environment where you could break out of that 57 and a half, 58 level, see some really good price appreciation into 62. And then if you do see that catch up argument, you're talking 70, uh, $70 pre pandemic. And so you're at an environment where I do think the investors are a little bit cautious, maybe even hopeful, right? Hopeful in the sense that, please, Exxon, please, this is your moment. Mm -hmm. Please, Exxon, this is the time. If there was ever a time, Exxon, now is that time, right? That's what the investors are doing, right? But as, if you're the individual that isn't an investor in Exxon, obviously, we, we're not going to have a trade coming in earnings on Exxon. But it is a company that should be on a watch list if we do get a positive catalyst out of earnings, couple that with technically breaking out of uh, 57 and a half by 58. There's not a lot that's going to stop this stock, for, in my opinion, technically or fundamentally until you get into a minimum of 62 and a half. And then it's, then it's ball game up until 70. So I, I do think 
you're and, and and I like this time frame, Mark. We're talking about something that literally could transpire this week, putting it on people's radar. I, I, you know, not just Exxon, you can do the sh- same thing with Chevron, right? But but so you, that is the argument, and I do think this week's going to play a big role in this stabilization argument. It's time for earning. Uh, it, Earnings out of out of energy companies are not going to be good. They're not going to be good. But we need to see progress. We this economy has been reopening for months and months and months and months. We've seen positive economic data coming out of specifically the U.S. and China for months and months and months and months. And those are the two biggest components when it comes to why crude and why energy does what it does. And so I do think it's time for us to see the data of, of, of a path to getting back to profitability. And so I do think you're in that moment where a catalyst could spark something that, that maybe rivals this type of price appreciation that energy had and that Exxon had specifically. So I think you're in a good environment. I think you're technically and fundamentally in the right, in the right, uh, right moment, right uh, environment as well. Now you're just waiting on those catalysts out of earnings. And this is the week we've been waiting for. This is the week we've been talking about with energy, you know, for the last two weeks, you know, anytime data came up on anything relating to uh, energy, even earnings reports last week, I'm like, so what? Those are refinery companies. We got to see Exxon. We got to see Chevron. We got to see those major, major drillers out there. Uh, Some, uh, you know, oil and uh, midstream components have been doing fairly decent. Can these big players do it as well? This is the week we find out, in my opinion. 